Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul and in this Rick Game to the Com video, we're going to be discussing and of course analysing tech news which as usual has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with AMD's Snowy Owl because some details of the platform as well as the chips themselves have emerged onto the internet. Then we're going to move over to AMD's embedded GPU solutions which is going to be utilising the Polaris architecture, specifically the E9170 graphics cards. And then finally, we'll talk about Qualcomm and Apple, as the two companies fight one another yet again over litigation. But we'll start things out, as I just mentioned, with AMD's Snowy Owl, which, by the way, is a very cool name, at least in my opinion. It is, of course, a code name, just to clarify. So what is Snowy Owl? Well, it is touted to be the next generation of AMD Optron processors, and is specifically geared, although not limited to, usage in communications and networks. Uh, the idea, at least according to AMD's official slide, which was leaked a couple of years ago, uh, but most stuff should at least still be relatively uh, on track, is it, it will offer ideal communications for a networking with a compelling com performance and superior slash IO integration. Very quick rundown of the performance, 4 to 16 AMD Zen cores, which means of course 16 to 32 threads if you take into consideration SMT, the usual 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache per core, and the obligatory 8 megabytes of level 3 cache per 4 cores. Memory configurations are basically what you would anticipate with ECC support up to 2667 megahertz, and of course support for uh, all of the latest standards, including UDIM, RDIM, LRDIM, NVDIM, when it comes to I.O. though, this is probably one of the stronger areas for AMD and it has been throughout this generation. 64 PCIe lanes, of course, generation 3. We did, just a few days ago, discuss the soon to be released, and I say that tentatively, PCIe 4. The final specifications for that, of course, have just been uh, released and we know that PCIe 4 is probably touted to start appearing in some devices next year, but... Unfortunately, it's not going to be long before PCIe 5 essentially just replaces it. So PCIe 4 is going to have a very short shelf life, especially compared to 3, Generation 3. Anyway, uh, continuing on, up to 32 SATA uh, devices, or MVME if you prefer, up to 8 or um, 10 base KR or 1 gigabit Ethernet, and of course server controls, which is the standard stuff, uh, UART, USB, SPI, for those of course who are server administrators, which quite frankly I haven't done in a long ass time, you're probably more familiar with that stuff than I, and dedicated security subsystems, which is definitely something that uh, AMD have very much touted, and it's pr very cool, the too long didn't read of that, if you're unfamiliar with the whole purpose of it, is that if you have a rogue administrator, let's say who has control of one VM, so let's say you have two VMs on the same platform, and VM1 is either under malicious control through, through for example, a Trojan or some other virus, and or uh, it just has been requisite with a actual uh, rogue administrator, they won't be able to access the data in the second VM. They're essentially segmented um, in memory, and basically it's all done via encryption, and it's a very smart way to do things. Regardless, back on to the uh, actual information. We finally have information on the first Epic processor, which is going to be the 3251, and it's going to be an embedded SOC form factor utilizing the SP4R2 BGA socket. This platform is probably going to be around until at least 2018, possibly the start of 2019, when, of course, it will be succeeded by Starship. Now, how Starship and the um, details of the next generation Epic all managed to roll into one another is not quite known. I did discuss a possibility of an Epic 2, which, at least according to the folks over at uh, Canard, they are claiming it's going to have double the number of cores, or double the number of threads for the maximum skew. But is that going to be accurate? Quite frankly, I don't know. But they have been fairly accurate in the past when it comes to other AMD information. Speaking of which, I want to touch on something that 
was actually revealed about mm, several weeks ago, actually, about three or four weeks ago, but there's more information now that the products are essentially starting to roll out, and that is the uh, Radeon Embedded Series, which is the E9170. So there's a couple of different formats for this. The first is uh, an MCM. Now, this has integrated memory for smaller power and efficient GPU design, as well as PCI Express, and then the second one is an MXM format. So that's more for standard form factor systems. So how much power does this thing have in terms of performance, of course, not how many gigawatts it could generate? Well, 512 stream processors, once again, based upon Polaris. So that means a grand total of eight compute units. The clock speeds aren't too bad, actually, given its form factor, you're looking at 1124 or 1219 megahertz, which is not too anemic at all, really. And this is running with 8 GBPS GDDR5 memory. And your bus web, well, that really depends on the setup, but it's between 64 and 128 bit. So obviously, memory bandwidth is not exactly going to be stellar, but once again, the usage scenario. Now, perhaps more interestingly, uh, to some. Oh, and by the way, if you can hear some explosions going on in the background, I've not suddenly been teleported onto the set of Star Wars. Instead, it is, if you don't know, uh, the 5th of November here in the UK, which of course means fireworks night. So the performance of these things is actually fairly decent with the power consumption. Now, obviously, it does depend upon the usage scenario, as well as, of course, other things like memory controllers and all the other bits and bobs. But it's going to be utilizing, uh, assuming it's an MCM form factor, less than 40 watts. And if it's MXM, it's going to be less than 50, which is pretty damn good. As I said, memory configuration uh, is going to be 128 or 64 bit. But this means you've got either a choice of four or two gigabytes of memory. Performance-wise, well, yeah, once again, it's not amazing. It's going to be around the performance of the RX 550. So once again, it's not anything that's going to, you know, destroy the universe with its level of computational power, but it sits at around 1.2, 1.3 G-flops of performance. Or to put it a different way, although obviously it's a very different system configuration, about the performance of the original Xbox One. Of course, the benefit the Xbox One had is it's a very custom design, and therefore developers could squeeze every last jot, iota, and nugget. I have to admit, I was thinking of another term I could use there. Nugget of performance out of it. So you're not going to get that level of performance here with this type of GPU, but still, like gaming, perhaps like compute work, it should be absolutely fine. What's not fine, though? I'll tell you, Qualcomm. Now, there has been some talk of an acquisition rumor, which is between Broadcom and Qualcomm, but it's looking like that might be a bit shaky, simply because of the market cap currently of uh, Qualcomm. But... What isn't shaky is Intel, Apple, and Qualcomm, and the three companies seeming to be doing this dance. Now, admittedly, litigation and Intel is a bit like me saying to you, I don't know, oxygen is good for health. But when it comes to Apple, they're not exactly slouches in the litigation arena either. However, this one is looking particularly nasty, although I do suspect it's going to be dragged out for quite some time. Basically, the accusations are that Qualcomm, uh, Qualcomm are making these accusations, just to clarify. They are suing Apple because they believe it's violated a licensed software contract. What does this mean? Well, basically, because Apple um, were purchasing uh, chips from Qualcomm, I think that's fairly common knowledge, Apple were not happy, supposedly, on the prices that Qualcomm were charging for its chips. For some reason, Qualcomm wanted to have a fair price for its chips, and Apple, those little rascals, they didn't want to pay that, did they? So, what happened is, uh, this is alleged, I don't want to say this is, you know, fact, but allegedly, um, they needed, that is, Apple needed help. And so, the engineers over Apple decided to disclose information which it obtained from Qualcomm. Now, the reason it was able to get this information is because Apple, obviously, are a major player in the industry. So it basically pressured Qualcomm to provide this highly confidential, those are exact words, information to Apple, 
And then after that, this information was essentially CC'd, um, literally copied in to an Intel engineer. So basically, uh, just once again to clarify, Qualcomm were asked by Apple, yeah, we need this information. Qualcomm wanted to keep its contracts and keep Apple sweet. So it did so, it provided this information, but obviously said, hey, uh, this is kind of se top secret, guys. We'd prefer you don't give this to any of our major competitors. And then that information was passed over to Intel. And now Qualcomm are suing um, Apple because it alleges that this information that it's managed to grab is now helping App uh, Intel with broadband modem chips. And obviously, one of the components inside the iPhone 7 is Apple, uh, sorry, is Intel's broadband modem chips. So obviously, this was like Apple slapping Qualcomm for not lowering its prices, then also simultaneously helping Intel have an insight into their proprietary technology. Now, if this is true, and obviously I don't know this for a fact because I don't have a copy of those emails and I don't work at either of the, well, any of the three companies, this is going to get messy because obviously if there's an email chain, then investigators are going to start looking into it and then, of course, their investigators are going to start looking for plausible deniability or whatever. It's just going to get absolutely ridiculous and... I don't want to come down on any side here, but if it's true, it's very unethical of Apple. I and I know I'm probably going to get some flack in the comments for this, but I don't actually blame Intel as much because it's like they're not technically asking. Um, yeah, okay. The Intel engineer, uh, from what I'm reading anyway, they wanted the information but they couldn't get it. It's not like Intel could have asked Qualcomm for this information. So instead, they're saying to Qualcomm, hey, if you want help with this project, we need to know how this works. Then Apple were the one, sorry, they, uh, AM, Intel asked Apple, then of course Apple asked Qualcomm without telling Qualcomm that they were then going to communicate this information to, to Intel. And well, it's just what it is. Now, obviously, um, it's probable that you could argue that Intel were very unethical to take this information, and I would 100% grant you that that's not cool, but I would also grant you that Apple should not have supplied them with this information in the first place, and it's just going to get very, very messy. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care, and bye for now.